In this video, I'm going to be taking a look at this, a Macintosh Plus. It has a seemingly innocuous label that I guess I put there that says doesn't boot. Well, how many things could cause a Macintosh not to boot? Uh, we're going to find out some of them today on this episode of the Retro Hack Shack. Well, hey everybody, welcome to the Retro Hack Shack. My name's Aaron, and thank you, I've got to say, for all of your kind comments. I really do enjoy reading them. You guys were great about commenting on the episode that I released on my second channel, where I looked at two full-size tower PCs. One of them blew up as I was trying to fix it, or the power supply did, and uh, you'll see that when it says I scream like a little girl. And uh, yeah, I absolutely did scream like a little girl. <laughs> <laughs> really scared me. I was not expecting the power supply to blow up uh, quite so uh, extraordinarily like it did. And I've got to turn the switch on the back. Ah! But thank you for all your comments. Thank you, especially to my patrons whose names are on the screen right now. Uh, if you want to join the patron club, that would be great. Could use a little few more patrons and could really use the support to keep the channel going. So thank you to all those who have already signed up for that. Anyway, let's get back to today's video. Now, I've got a project coming up and I need to get one of these working so that I can move along with that project. And it just so happened when I went out to test the Macintosh Pluses that I had on hand, uh, none of them were actually working. So I thought, okay, well, we'll do a video, we'll get these things fixed, and then I can move on with that project, and that'll be on an upcoming video. Now, I have gone ahead for time's sake and tested these already. This one, which is actually very light in color, I don't know if this was stored in a closet or something, but this looks probably very close to the original color of a Macintosh Plus. This one didn't boot at all. It had no signs of life at all. We'll check that one out in a minute. And this one had some signs of life, but maybe a little crackling going on. It says bad analog, meaning bad analog board, perhaps broken traces or joints, bad caps, question mark. So this one maybe has some signs of life, but isn't quite making it. Let's go ahead and take a look at the one that doesn't boot, this lighter colored one, and see what it's doing. This one has a bunch of stickers and tape and stuff on it, so somebody had a good time with this one. It looks like maybe there's a picture of the Earth with some sort of a copy tag or some sort of other sticker there. And then on this side, it says, way past tense. That's a kind of a neat sticker to have on there. I might leave that one on there just because it's uh, kind of unique and interesting. No other stickers that I can find on this thing. On the back, uh, there is no battery installed, so that's a good thing. And no corrosion down here on the uh, plugs and things down here at the bottom of the board, which is also a good sign. So everything is pointing to a system that is in good working order. However, when I plug this thing in like that, and turn it on. I can hear, maybe you can hear it. I hear like the, the drive or something starting to power up and it's just cycling. So it's almost like there's a power supply problem where the power supply isn't starting for some reason and it's just cycling over and over and over again, trying to start up and then shutting down. So at least that tells us something. Let's go ahead and crack this thing open, quite literally, and see what's going on inside. And I've got my extra long, even extra, extra long screwdriver. You don't need one quite this long, but you do need one that's, let's see, at least this long from the handle, which is about six inches. So you need at least, uh, from the handle, at least six inches to get back up in here and get to these screws that are way inside here. Otherwise you won't be able to reach them. So if you're looking for one of these, it is a, I believe a T15, T15 torque driver. So find one of those that's at least six inches from the handle to the tip. They might wanna get one that's eight inches just to be sure you can actually reach it because even at six inches, if your handle is up here, it still might be hard to turn. Uh, but anyway, looks like we're good to go here. Heard a little crack. There's a chance that maybe this thing has never been opened. Who knows? And I've done this so much at this point that I don't even really have to look up inside. I can do it by feel. And with the uh, this vintage of Mac, there's also one more screw up here in the battery compartment. So if your battery compartment is still on, or if the cover to the battery compartment is still on, and the case isn't coming off, open it up and take out this screw, and then you should be all set. Okay, these cases usually come off okay. Let's see if it wants to come off here. 
There we go. And now we can get our first look inside and see what we see. Okay, so now that we have this open, I do want to just issue a warning that you should not work inside of a CRT with the electronics exposed like this if you don't know what you're doing. So please be careful. There are extremely high voltages in here that can really give you a nasty shock. So for example, since we just had this powered up, even though we didn't get the high voltage or anything, I'm still gonna be discharging the CRT to get rid of that really high voltage before I start uh, doing anything that might require me to get very close to the CRT itself. So the first thing I wanna do is just get the board out of the uh, bottom here, the main board, and just make sure, inspect that, and just make sure that's okay. But really, I think the issue is gonna be on the analog board because I'm just used to hearing that cycling noise when things aren't going going well from the, uh, a start a power supply startup perspective. So that's what I'm th suspecting, but I'm just gonna go ahead and get this uh, main board out of the bottom here so we can take a look at that, make sure that looks okay. Okay, here's the main board. And interestingly enough, there is some sort of either an accelerator or something going on here. I'm not familiar with this one. It's from MicroMac Technology Incorporated. Let me get this thing off of here and see what's going on. It does seem to be, or appear to be plugged into the CPU socket down here. So let me get this thing off of here and we can see what it's doing. All right, well, here we go. I got this off. And uh, the way this uh, board works is that there is a clip-on uh, mechanism here, which then has a socket over here with pins on it so that you can make an easy connection without having to solder or desolder anything. Um, and then this plugs right into the uh, where the power comes in from the uh, analog board to this board. And then this, all the, the connections here for the processor goes over to this connector over here. So I'm assuming that this is actually missing the accelerator part. There was probably an accelerator board which would plug in here. And that's why this plastic actually extends over the RAM slots down here. It extends over the memory because this board would have gone uh, plugged into here and then probably sat this way across this board like that. Um, that's what I'm assuming anyway, but I went ahead and removed this. I'll probably leave this off for the duration of the testing just to eliminate this as a potential problem. And I will test this for shorts, this little board for shorts, but there's not really anything that can go wrong with it. It's just traces and connectors. So I don't think this is the source of the issue. This got me wondering if I could use this board with a Raspberry Pi Pico to make a Macintosh Plus accelerator. Well, if I wanted to start a project like that, I'd turn to the sponsor of today's episode, PCBWay. PCBWay offers low-cost, high-quality PCB manufacturing and a whole lot more. They offer flexible and rigid flexible PCBs. They offer surface mount assembly. They offer high-density PCBs with up to 60 layers. They offer aluminum PCBs. And they also offer custom metal and plastic parts that need to be CNC milled or 3D printed. One of my favorite features on PCBWay's website is their project page, where the community can upload projects. You can browse these and order these particular parts so that you can use them yourself. Or you can create your own project by uploading your design and receive 10% back when someone else orders your particular project. So check out PCBWay for all your PCB manufacturing needs, and I thank them for their support of the Retro Hack Shack. All right, time to get in here with the probe. Safety first. Let's see if there's any high voltage left on this thing. Nope, not only that, but this is coming off, so I might as well take it off. There we go. I really need to find a different tip for this, one that has kind of a sliding, thinner mechanism so that I can get down underneath those anode caps a little bit easier. All right, I checked the board for shorts. There's no shorts on the board itself, but I do want to check analog board for the power that's coming from the analog board just to see if there's any shorts there. Yeah, no shorts on the power rails either on the board side or the power supply side. All right, I'm turning my attention to the analog board now. I'm going to take it off and have a better uh, look at it. But one thing I'm noticing is right here on the flyback and back in here, there is some really nasty brown stuff that they probably added to make sure that things weren't vibrating, but it does not look good. And back in there, that looks a little bit more like corrosion. So yeah, I'm uh, a little dubious that this flyback might be the source of the issue, but let's continue the investigation. Okay, I'm just about ready to take off the protective shield here to check for bad solder joints. 
before I do, I just want to note that up here where the flyback transformer is, you can see these brown, it's kind of burnt or these brown markings up here. So I am kind of wondering if there is some sort of a, a bad solder joint or, you know, something that's burnt up up there. And that's why the power supply isn't going into regulation like it should. Like I said, I'm highly suspect of this flyback transformer, especially now that I see those brown spots. But we'll give that a shot and I'll be sure to look very carefully there for, like I said, broken solder joints or something like that. All right, well, I'm putting this back together for a quick test without the accelerator attachment board. I am gonna leave the clip on here because I don't think that could be causing any problems without that board on there. But anyway, uh, one thing that I noticed is that this rail here where the motherboard slots into the chassis is actually bent. So it's possible that someone took this apart at some point and didn't know how to get the motherboard out and bent this with a screwdriver or something. I'm just gonna make a note of that in case this comes back around to being a problem where, you know, I can find either a screwdriver mark or something over here that maybe, maybe they hit a, they hit a pin and it's got come off the board or something. I don't see anything like that, but just going to make a note that this is definitely bent. All right. Well, I've checked out the analog board. I don't see any cracked solder joints or any signs of any kind of component failing. Obviously, I've checked all the diodes as well, just because if there was a, a diode somewhere that wasn't working correctly, that could cause something like this. And, and speaking of diodes, it could also be the optocoupler, which is down in the corner of the board. I'll be checking that out as well if this doesn't work. But anyway, you know, it could also just be a bad connection on the low voltage side or again, something wrong with the flyback. So there's tons of things that could be wrong, but I've eliminated that board. I've plugged and unplugged everything. I've checked the continuity of the uh, wires that are going from the analog board to the logic board down here, the motherboard. Those all seems to be fine. So not really sure what's going on, but everything is back installed enough to do a test. I'll be very careful with this side of the board since the shield is off, but let's go ahead and plug this thing back in. Just see if it's doing anything different now. Okay, we've got live mains voltage, so fingers clear. Let's see what happens. Did I hear? Did I hear high voltage? Well, it definitely looks like I'm getting some sort of high voltage out of this thing based on the spectrum analyzer. There's way over here, I can see some kind of high voltage come on right when I turn this on. So something's doing something. Okay, I plugged the uh, floppy back in. Let's just see what happens now. See if that noise comes back that I was hearing before. No, it sounds like it's activating the drive just like once as it comes on. Not getting the chirping, but it's still not working. All right, well, I've been working on this for a while and here's where I'm at with my thought process. I'm not 100% sure that there's anything wrong with this analog board. I have been testing it. I've been going through the Dead Max Scrolls, which is a great troubleshooting guide, just testing various components and things, and I can't find anything wrong with it. Now, there could be a cracked solder joint somewhere, but I'm not hearing that or seeing any signs of that. So I think what I'm going to do is just for completeness, I will go ahead and reflow all the connections that tend to be problematic, where you might get a cracked solder, solder joint, like the flyback transformer and anywhere where there's there's a connector to the board, either the power connectors or the ones that go to the CRT. I'll go ahead and reflow all those just for completeness, but I am a little bit suspect since we're not getting a bong on the motherboard, I think that could be the problem. Maybe the CRT is working fine and we're just not getting the video signals out. So after I reflow this, I'll get it hooked back up and then I'll set this up off to the side very carefully like this, and I'll be able to probe the uh, video connections here and see if we're getting a video signal. And I'll also be able to probe the CPU itself and see if the CPU is actually starting up. So that should verify whether the board is working. All right, well, that didn't take too long. I went ahead and reflowed all those solder joints I mentioned. I've got the board connected over here. So let's go ahead and turn it on and just see if there's any difference at all. I don't think there is, but let's just see if there's any difference at all in the, uh, if we get a picture or anything or a bong, hopefully, hey, who knows, right? Here we go. All right, well, let's let the CRT warm up, but I don't see any difference as expected. I think the analog board is actually working okay, but before, this is exactly what was happening before. No picture on the screen and no, hey, 
wait a second. <laughs> Look at that. We're actually getting an image now. I guess those solder, there must have been some cracked solder joints that I couldn't see. <gasps> what the heck? Is this actually working? Oh my word, this was not working at all before, guys. There must have been something screwy in those cracked solder joints. Oh my word. Okay, let me get this put back together and get the floppy drive hooked up and we'll see if this is working. But the picture looks fantastic. Wow, I cannot believe it. Okay, well I found that if I angled this just right, I could get the floppy cable connected to this machine. And I think what threw me off on this particular Mac Plus is that the there was no bong. So either the speaker is bad or maybe the cable connection is bad, although I did trace out the cable and it was fine, so I don't think it's that. But maybe I just have a bad speaker in here or something that I need to be, need to replace. So to test that, what I did was I just hooked up a couple of pin headers to pins four, which is the sound pin, and seven, which is a ground pin on that connector on the back of the board here, and then just using a PC speaker to see if we get any sound out of this, because without having that bong, it made me think that maybe the board was bad, but obviously the board seems to be working. So the bong misled me here a little bit, and luckily I did focus on the analog board and getting those connections resoldered first before I started working on the board. So I've got everything connected. Let's go ahead and turn it on and see if we can boot this thing up and see if we get a bong. Here we go. Yep, sure enough, right away, bong. If I had heard that before, oh man, I wouldn't have spent so much time looking up stuff and, and whatnot. I would have gone directly to the analog board knowing that the uh, motherboard was probably just fine. But now I've got no video again. What the heck is going on? Okay, the board is definitely working. Let's put in a cleaning disc into the floppy and just make sure it looks like it's booting. Ooh, that is chunky. Chunky monkey, so the floppy drive doesn't appear to be working. Oh, there it goes. Oh, there goes the, the display is up. Yeah, definitely another loose connection on the board here somewhere. Ah. So I gotta troubleshoot that and the floppy drive's not working. Okay, so I've got the board connected. Went ahead and took the floppy drive out. I'll take a look at that in a minute. But basically, I wanna see where, you can see as I'm banging on it, something's making it come in and out. And I tap on this board, analog board with a non-conductive tool here. You can see not much is happening. If I tap on this board, not much is, oh. Okay, so now we've got this, basically when I put pressure on this board going this way, which is causing that cable between the analog board and the logic board here, the motherboard, to tighten, that's when we get the image. So I'm guessing there's something wrong either in the cable or in the connectors. I've reflowed both sides of the solder joint, so I don't think it's that, but something in there is definitely a miss. And that would have been actually pretty hard to troubleshoot if I had the board installed correctly in the thing. I'm not saying that everybody should run their systems with dangerous voltages exposed here, but certainly having it like this in this case anyway, has led me to most likely that connector being the, being the culprit. The other things that move a little bit are the, the neck connector here, but I'm touching that with the non-conductive probe. That doesn't seem to make any difference. Moving the anode doesn't seem to make any difference. Moving the deflector connections don't seem to make any difference. The only thing that makes a difference is this right here. Okay, well I've done extensive testing on this cable and I don't see any issues with it. So what I did was I used some deoxit both on the pins and on the board, the uh, connections on the boards that go to the cable. What I also did was I used my macro mode on my phone like this to look at each individual uh, socket where that internal pin is to make sure that it wasn't bent or crimped or you know making sure it was it wasn't loose making good connection with everything and I checked it from both sides I checked it from the front 
And I also went ahead and checked it from this side as well. Of course, I'm not holding it very well. This is just for demonstration, but I really did look in there really good to make sure that all the pins looked okay, and they do. So maybe it was just a corroded connection, either with the pins on the boards or in the sockets. Anyway, they're all cleaned up now. Whoops, there goes my phone. Hey, and just a quick tip, in case you saw my review of this meter, which I'm still using, by the way, and just recharged it. I don't know how many weeks, couple months later maybe, I finally had to charge it up, so battery does last pretty well. But anyway, I said that there probably wasn't a very good use for this function generator because it was kind of crappy, but there are simple things you can do with it, like test the speakers out. So if you have a speaker and you're not sure if it works, I've got one kilohertz tone or frequency going on right here at 2.5 volts, and I've got one side connected to one side of the uh, speaker here. And if I connect the other side, you can hear I've got a tone in that speaker, so I know that that speaker is good. Likewise, if I connect these to the speaker on the Mac here, let's see if we get anything. Absolutely nothing. So now I've confirmed that the speaker really is dead and it's not just a broken wire or something like that. So there is a use for that kind of crappy function signal generator on this thing. As far as the speaker is concerned, I removed the old one. There are a little, couple little rivets that you can just, uh, you know, either drill out or I just crimped them out with a pair of needle nose pliers until they went through the hole there. But uh, I took that one out. There was no resistance between the terminals of the speaker, so it's completely gone. Now, the original Mac speakers were 63 ohms. I've replaced this with an 8 ohm, which should be fine if you are concerned about overdrying the amp overdriving the amplifier or something like that. You could put a maybe a 56 ohm resistor or something on one of the terminals, but that's going to put all the power in the resistor and not necessarily in the speaker. So this speaker should be a little bit louder. And from everything I can read online, it does seem like it's safe to put an eight ohm speaker in here. But if you can get your hands on an original 63 ohm speaker or order one online, you might be able to find them on Mauser or DigiKey, then that would be a better thing to do than what I'm doing here. But because I'm kind of under a time crunch and I want to see if I can get this thing up and running, I used the 8 ohm speaker and I held it down with just a little bit of E6000 glue in a couple of spots. So, whoops, it's not dry yet. <laughs> I'll let this sit for another 15 minutes or so and then it should be completely fine to put back in the case. All right, well, all that stuff with the cable didn't help, but I think I finally found it. And what I did was I started measuring all the voltages that on this side of the board, on the logic side of the board. And then I started moving this in and out and seeing if any of those voltages changed. They did not change on this side. Then I did the same thing to the connections on this side and I found out that they did change on the video pin specifically. And I'll put a picture in here and you can see that somehow when I was reflowing those solder joints, I missed that pin and that one does have a crack on it as hopefully you can see in the picture. So I'm gonna go reflow that pin and then I think this thing will be working except for the floppy drive. Yep, and there we go. I can move that cable as much as I want now. Nothing, it's not losing the video signal anymore. So finally have that problem fixed. Awesome. Okay, well, I'm just jumping back in here because I've done a number of things. I'm not gonna go over everything I did to get this drive into almost working order. There's a lot of good videos on there about how to uh, re-lubricate and recondition these drives, but it does seem to be pretty much working. I do have a bad gear in the original motor, so I swapped that out with one that I had with parts, and I'll go back and fix that one later and lubricated everything. The other thing I noticed was that someone had taken the head and bent it way back which you really can't do because that's basically just held on with this leaf spring back here, a piece of copper. And when you bend it too far back, then this head doesn't have any force going down on it to uh, get it to rest on top of the media that's going around. And so it can't read the information off the disc. Well, now what I was able to do is actually take a small screwdriver and I was able to get the screwdriver in between the top head and the bottom head here in the back. And then I was able to apply some pressure to the head to reform that spring. And now it's almost touching when I don't have this little black piece in here that this normally rides on. 
um, the heads are almost touching. And I think now all that needs to happen is so there is a spring back here. You can't see it and I can't even show it to you because it's way in there. In fact, I, I just don't have a way to show you, but there is a spring back there that's putting some tension, some downward force on this top head. And I think that that spring now also needs to be adjusted because it's not putting enough downward pressure on the top head in order to get things tight enough to read the information off the disc. Let me show you how I know that or how I've tested that in case this ever happens to you. Okay, I do have the uh, protective shield up here. I know it's still live voltage in here, but that's okay. I wanna show you what's going on here. So the drive is hooked up temporarily here. If I go ahead and turn it on, Get the bong, I've got a Macintosh system tools disc version 6.0.8. So let's wait just a minute and should get the looking for a disc icon. There it goes. Okay, I've got to be careful not to. Okay, it did, uh, it did open up the drive for me because it was closed. If I put this in, it's going to immediately kick it back out again. Now, if I put it in and put just a slight pressure, not much, just a tiny bit of pressure on the head, let's see if it reads. I'm just putting a tiny, tiny bit of pressure on the head and it does start to read. It reads for a little bit and then it uh, it kicks it out. Either the head is out of alignment, which is which is one possibility for me straightening, straightening that out, or like I suspect, there's just not enough pressure on the on the top head to actually get it to read the disc. So I'm gonna go ahead and see if I can adjust that spring in there and hopefully get this thing to work. All right, now getting the head assembly out isn't too difficult. Um, the, actually, there's two screws on this side of the drive. One of them's right there. You can see I've already taken it out. And another one is, I can't see where I'm pointing, uh, in here, I've already taken that out. And then there are these, uh, little connectors here, the ribbon connectors that go over to the head. You have to take both of those out and then you should be able to lift the head assembly out. And as you can see, sorry for the handheld camera here, it's already loose, but I haven't taken out these connectors. So I'll take out these connectors, should be able to pull the head assembly out without touching these back two screws or without uh, loosening these back two screws. Because if you did that, then your head would really be out of alignment. All right, now, as you can see, I've got the head assembly out. And on the bottom side here, right in the back, right back here, you can see there's the spring, which is attached to the lowest, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, the lowest notch. And then there are two other notches here. I'm going to try to move the spring from the lowest notch up to the, the tallest notch or the highest notch. So maybe you can see just below my finger here, the other end of the spring that's pulling the top head down. It's right in the middle of that gap right there. All right, so the head is back installed and I'm ready to test this out. So if I can reach around here safely and turn this on. Well, it moved the head back to the starting position, so that's good. Still have the bong. There we go. We got the flashing question mark. Let's see if this drive is actually going to read this disc now. Looking good so far. Got a happy Mac. Welcome to Macintosh. Yeah, this thing's working fine. No head misalignment, just bad tracking force or, or tension in the uh, top head there. I'm trying not to shake this with my hand. <laughs> I'm sitting here very awkwardly <laughs> holding this drive. Now, there we go. We're into the operating system. Awesome. So we've taken this system from not working at all, all the way to all sorts of problems. And now it's actually working. My shoulder is getting tired holding this drive. So I'm gonna go ahead and put everything back together and then we'll just hook up a mouse and make sure everything's working. 
Okay, well I've got the case back together and I went ahead and cleaned the whole thing. It is really looking like it's brand new. The only thing I didn't remove was this sticker way past tense because I don't know, I just think it's funny. It's kind of slapped on here sideways like this. I don't know who put this on here, but you know, I just think it's kind of funny. So anyway, I left that sticker on, but everything else I wiped down, I got all the tape gunk off and really did a good job on it. And it was in pretty good shape to begin with. So I can't complain too much. All right, so now that everything is back together, I think we need to give this just one more try. Let's power it on and bring this thing back to life. Now, while we're waiting for the disc symbol to appear here in the middle, I went ahead while well, I had this taken apart and I widened the vertically the display here to get a little bit wider. And when I did that, I noticed, I'm not sure you're going to be able to pick this up on camera, but there is just a hint of burn in where the screen uh, vertical uh, boundaries were before. And when I widen that now, all of a sudden I can see that little bit of burn in there, which is too bad because otherwise this is a really decent CRT, I must say. I don't know, I may have to set that back just so that it doesn't annoy me going forward. But we've got our little cursor here, so let's go ahead and pop in a disc. It goes right in. I don't know if you remember before when I tried to insert this thing, it wouldn't do anything because it was so clogged up, so nasty, so gross. And now it's working like it's brand new. That head alignment, of course, is working as we saw before. And yeah, this is gonna boot up into Macintosh. There it is right there. Everything's working. I did connect a mouse to it. The mouse is working and I connected a keyboard to it. And I found out that the keyboard connection down here was a little bit corroded or dirty. So I went ahead and scrubbed it with some vinegar. Then I scrubbed it with some alcohol and then I added some deoxid. And I also bent those pins up a little bit to make a better connection with the pins on the cable. And yes, this is a cable that I made. You gotta be careful when you do that. I did a video actually on this that you can look up online on how to make those cables. But anyway, that solved the problems with the keyboard or at least the keyboard is now working. And that's important because this keyboard is part of the project I mentioned earlier. Maybe not this keyboard, but a lot of keyboards actually are part of the project that I mentioned earlier in the episode. So that was the critical part really of this whole project. All the work I did on this thing was really just to make sure I had a working Macintosh Plus with a solid working keyboard connection so that I can work on that other project. But this thing is looking great. I can't complain at all. This is gonna make a really good addition to my collection. There were so many things wrong with this thing. It's just really nice to see it up and running and working once again. Now, one question I have for you guys is what do I do with this adapter? I mean, it's obviously it must have had an accelerator card here, right? That probably came off at a right angle or something. I've got this little bracket that goes on a 68,000. But yeah, what do I do with this? Is there something that could plug in here that I don't know, might work with a with a Macintosh Plus or one of the other Macs or something. I just don't know what to do with this adapter. For now, I'm gonna put it in my spare parts bin, but if you have an idea of what I can do with this adapter, please let me know in the comments below. Well, I am so glad that this Mac is finally booting and we're gonna have to peel off this label that I put on there because this Mac does indeed boot now. As I mentioned, I have a special purpose for wanting to restore this Macintosh Plus. It's an upcoming project. It'll probably take a few weeks or maybe even a few months at the rate that I'm going to get that episode online. But I'll tell you more about that when that episode comes along. Until then, if you like videos about Apple or Macintosh and especially repairing and restoring Macintoshes and Apple products, I have a whole playlist that you're going to love. And I also have a video that I think you're going to like. I'm going to put it up here in the corner or up here somewhere and uh, I'll see you in that video coming up next. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye. End of line.